Okay, so is that readable enough? A little small, maybe? All right, well, I, I just wanna see if I can, can get it a little bit bigger. Your new mental model for Constexper. If um, this isn't the session that you're planning to be in, then you ran out of time to get to the correct room. See if I can clean this up a little bit, smooth that font out, center it. Okay, so this is your new mental model for Constexper. Uh, my name is Jason Turner, host of C++ Weekly, there's stickers, co-host of CBPCast, I do training, code reviews, speaking, um, that kind of thing. I did that one Commodore 64 talk a few years ago that a lot of people liked. I just thought it was funny to put that in here because I've had so many people be like, hey, you're the one who, yeah, I'm the one who did that talk. Okay. Uh, oh, I think I forgot to put this on the slide, but my style is you interrupt me and just yell out questions if you have them. I know I'm supposed to repeat them. If I can't hear you, if you're in the back, you have a mask on, it's more difficult to hear than come up to a mic or something. I'm gonna give a little bit of history on Constexper. Some ideas to get you thinking differently about Constexper. Some practical application. So what is Constexper? My words, simply put, Constexper in C++ is the act of moving computation from runtime to compile time. So I want to break some people's opinions here. Constexper is not metaprogramming. See, these are two different things. According to Wikipedia, metaprogramming is a programming technique in which, a computer, in which computer programs have the ability to treat other programs as their data. It means that a program can be designed to read, generate, analyze, or transform other programs and even modify itself while running. Wikipedia goes on to say, template metaprogramming which is what we think of in C++ when we talk about metaprogramming usually, is a metaprogramming technique in which templates are used by a compiler to generate temporary source code, which is merged by the compiler with the rest of the source code and then recompiled. My note, effectively templates and types are the program that's being manipulated by your program as data. So I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about moving, code from runtime to compile time. Very high level overview of, X, of Constexper. I mean, I teach entire classes on Constexper, so we're not gonna do all that here. In C++ 11, you could have a single return statement only. I'm just pointing at Ben because I knew he had so much fun doing Constexper things in C++ 11. Constexper members implied const. You could not have mutable member functions in C++11 that were Constexper. Non-virtual members only, no switching or branching technically, but you can have ternaries. So you can accomplish an awful lot in C++11's model of Constexper. Almost Turing complete. I commented on Twitter at some point that it was Turing complete and then I got corrected. Um, does it matter if it's Turing complete, Ben? Yeah. Ben says it doesn't matter if it's Turing complete. Uh, very little standard library support. Things that could have been Constexper in C11 even weren't yet with the limitations and all types that you used ha had to be literal. C++14, we're allowed to have multiple statements in our functions now. Ooh, that was fancy. 
const xmer members no longer implied const. I think that's technically a be breaking change from 11 to 14, because if you had a const xmer member that wasn't explicitly const, then you recompiled in 14, it's no longer a const member function. Lambdas not yet allowed in C14. It is, I think, definitely Turing complete. But again, I sorry, just referencing Ben because he said last night Turing completeness is overrated. So Turing complete we'll just we'll take Ben's word for that at the moment. Uh, and C17, much more standard library support. Very helpful. Lambdas now not only can be used in a const expert context, they're the only part of the language that is implicitly const expert enabled when it can be. C20, just opening the floodgates in C20. We've got const expert dynamic allocations, uh, although they can't leave const expert land, that's a different story. Const expert destructors, const expert vector, const expert string, const expert standard algorithms, const expert virtual functions. Uh, we're allowed to put throw, and we're allowed to put catch statements as long as we don't execute them in a const expert function. We can do anything. So the question is, what can be done with compile time, at compile time with const expert? Technically, anything. In C11, we can do almost anything. It was almost Turing complete. Practically speaking, anything. A few years ago, I presented at CppCon an ARM emulator that I wrote that was const expert enabled. I can feed it instructions at compile time and execute them. I think that's kind of the very definition of Turing completeness at compile time there. Uh, so do we have any questions yet before I move on about what's possible in const expert context? I'm in a room full of const experts. <laughs> what's that, Marshall? Saving, yes, I, well, I'm planning to get a t-shirt, const expert. It'll be a thing. <laughs> Make stickers, yeah, const expert. Oh, are you now, I'm not just gonna have a bunch of marketing ideas now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so. You, uh, sorry, the, the comment was that you, have, you still have a poor mental model of what is possible with const expert. Right, so that's what we're going to try to directly address now. Now, I'm making the argument that you can do anything at compile time. The problem is a lot of people have a hard time coming up with things to do at compile time. So what is this new mental model that I speak of? You all already knew everything that I already just said, right? You didn't have any questions about it. This is the const expert continuum. Maybe I should get that as a t-shirt also. Unfortunately, no one can tell you what the const expert continuum is. You have to see it for yourself. Okay, good, at least a few people got the matrix reference. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's the idea that somewhere between 0% and 100% of your program can be executed at compile time. Want to reiterate, I'm not talking about metaprogramming. I'm talking about trying to decide how much of your program you want to execute at compile time instead of runtime. We've got on the simple end, static const expert auto start equals 15. That's a lot of keywords, but you know, I just created a compile time constant called start. It is an integer, it has the value 15. We could have done that with a macro, right? Pound define. Slightly harder to do with a macro is the fact that we can make a new compile time constant built off of a previous compile time constant. I mean, I could do that with a macro, but it's not really the same thing. 
more advanced, we're talking like CTRE. This is the compile time regular expressions from Hannah Duzakova. Um, this is regular expressions that are compiled at compile time and executed at runtime. Are you familiar with CTRE? Wow, that's virtually everyone. So, uh, if for those of you who didn't raise your hands, are you familiar with standard regex? Okay, and it's, sorry to any implementers of the standard library in our midst, it is terribly slow. And a large portion of the pain that you pay when you use standard regex is the moment that you're actually creating the regex object itself as it's parsing the regular expression and building its internal data structures. All of that happens at compile time with CTRE, so you get this highly efficient thing that you can execute at runtime. It's really cool. On the silly end is the world's fastest runtime ray tracer from Charles Giesen, who's right here in the front row. Charles's uh, world fastest runtime ray tracer does all of the ray tracing at compile time, then when you run the program, it just writes the image file. It's silly, but it proves the point that somewhere between zero and 100% of your program can be executed at compile time. And then you have something that kind of spans this continuum, like my constructs for enabled ARM emulator that I mentioned. So this is the continuum. You are here. Oh, Jason. Yes. Um, Where's that? Anything can be done, <laughs> but what should be done? That is, in my day-to-day -day programming, what's my approach for const expression? Without being able to speak to you specifically about the actual problem domain that you work in, I can't give a generic answer to that, right? But through the rest of this talk, I am going to give examples about practical things that people don't normally stop and think, hey, that could become a const expert thing. Maybe I should be looking at the camera, not looking at Tim, because the person who asked the question is gonna be looking at me this way. Um, uh, some practical things that, that like show you, really, because I even have a slide coming up here that says, people go, well, there's nothing I can move to compile time. There is. All right, so hopefully we'll get there. Oh, and uh, one comment. Um, is it not metaprogramming because you're not programming on the domain of programs? That would be my argument, yes. I'm saying it's not metaprogramming because I am not creating new programs at compile time. I'm not programming programs, if you will in the metaprogramming definition sense, I am just saying I had 0% of my program running at compile time, now I have 10% of it running at compile time. So you are here on the const expert continuum, wherever that tick mark is. You can, you can fork the continuum, like, uh, hit the right button here, like this. So if I had 10% of it done at compile time, so I, I really kind of wanted to get that picture from Back to the Future where Doc Brown is like, this is the 1985 that you know. We went back in time to 1955. No? Okay. Um, we can take whatever work was done at compile time and then at runtime simply make a copy of the work up to that point and keep modifying it. We'll talk about that more too. So, to answer now, kind of, to start getting to that question, what can I move to Constexper? It is a mental hurdle for, I find, a lot of people. I end up teaching classes and then I get comments back like, well, we don't have anything in our, in our project that's known at compile time. And so I'll say something like, well, what about, a static const vector of 10 elements. Could, could that be like a const expert array? And they're like, oh yeah, we have that all over the place in our code. So it's, it's, it's just a process, and we'll see if we can get there by the end of this talk. Um, just, you see the slide numbers there, 30 of 49. 
just for the record, that's just the first half of the talk. <laughs> Things change after that. So context for ideas, strings. Let's say, hypothetically, that uh, you are building on one pro compiler, on one platform, but you need to deploy on a different platform that has a different string representation. This is a good use of constexpr. So you might do something like this. Static constexpr auto string equals Petsky conversion of hello world. Does anyone know what Petsky stands for? Or what Petsky is? You know what Petsky is? It's the, uh, the characters for the uh, Commodore Pet. It's the characters for the Commodore Pet. The Commodore 64, the Pet, the VIC-20, they all used some version of Petsky and the 128, which means the plus four probably also in the C16, but those are more obscure. Um, so yeah, we could do that at compile time. we could create an entire compile time string conversion from, uh, of a table of strings, excuse me, from a host to the target string table, something like this. I might have static context per auto string, whatever string table, equals make string table. Make string table's just a context per function that takes a list of strings, converts each of them into a Petsky string, and then makes a table that you can access at runtime. All the work's done at compile time. We could do graphical resources. I mean, we could do runtime, compile time ray tracing, but I ran out of time to demonstrate that in this talk. I was just gonna steal Charles's code. I, I did, I think mention that to you that I might do it, yeah. Um, so you might do simple embedded bitmap font tables. Or on complex side, compile time scaling of fonts. That's definitely a thing. On the advanced side, ray traced bitmaps for display at runtime. So for context per fonts, um, compile time embedded font tables that could be copied and forked at runtime, modified further if we wanted to. Something like this. If I just wanted a regular font that's two times bigger than the input bitmap font that I had, then a nearest neighbor scaling algorithm gives me this blocky thing that's not nearly as attractive as I'd want. Uh, there's this HQ2X algorithm, um, which was developed by people who wanted to scale their graphics for emulators, excuse, better scaling of graphics for emulators. That's how I want to phrase that. It has this fancy lookup table. I don't have a fancy lookup table, but I was inspired by this because I wanted a smoothed over font and it was two times. So I could take this and I just spread out the pixels from the input. I just did a two times scaling, but I left all the gaps there. Then I can come in and say, well, if there's two pixels stacked on top of each other that are set anywhere, I can fill in the vertical gaps. And then if there's two pixels that are beside each other horizontally, I can come in and fill in the horizontal gaps. And then I can do one more pass and say, if there's anything that's got a diagonal gap from where I filled, uh, from where I scaled it, then I can fill that in. So I can actually get like a, a fairly good two times font scaling of a bitmap font, I feel like. And I can do that at compile time. So by doing the font scaling at compile time, I can actually get better quality and faster display than if I did it at runtime. Do you see that? Let's just take a quick look at this again. Watch this draw in. Let's take a look at filling in a long text full of sc uh, screen full of text here versus this. 
This is a runtime scaled font. This is the compile time scaled font. Just illustrating that it takes, that, it, that it's faster, and I think looks better. Okay, so other things that you might be able to do at compile time. If you have a presentation that you're giving, and you know that I've got a fixed set of slides in my presentation, that is something that I can actually run at compile time, right? This is good for slides. Does anyone have any kind of like state transition, table, state machine, anything like that in their code today? Okay, almost everyone. Does it change at runtime? Yeah, sometimes, no, okay. I'm looking at you since you said you don't have a good mental model. Does your, you did raise your hand saying that you have a state table of some sort. Does it change at runtime? Then that's something you can move to compile time. Could you move to compile time if you still want to dynamically load states for debugging time? You could certainly have some that are generated at compile time, and then you pass a reference to those to your state transition machine or whatever, and have some that are runtime, or you could have just a whole set of compile time ones and then choose which one of those you want to execute. Uh, slide numbers, that's interesting. See where it says 44 out of 49 down there at the bottom? Uh, it turns out that libformat, we're all, libformat, it's our favorite formatting library, right? Yeah? Turns out it has full const expert support now. So you can at, well not full, full const expert support, but you can at compile time generate a neat little list of slide numbers that tell you what slide you're currently on, so you don't have to do that at runtime if that would be a problem. Jason, yes. since we're talking about compile and runtime, um, is there any way to know if a particular const expert function is happening at compile time or runtime, other than diving into the compiler output? Uh, the simplest answer I can give is if you have static const expert, you are effectively guaranteed that that object is going to be evaluated at compile time. Does that answer the question, do you think, Tim? Since you relate it, okay. All right, so by moving more to, oopsie. I got off a little bit here. There we go. This presentation that I'm currently giving is about 32K. I was limited to 32,768 bytes. It is currently at 32,758 bytes. Boy. Yeah, I got 10 bytes of headroom here. About 17K of this is just compile time data tables. It's slide transitions, it's text representations, it's fonts, it's that stuff. So just in case you hadn't caught on at this point for stating the obvious, I am actually running this whole first half of the presentation on a Commodore 64 emulator written in C++ 20. I didn't hold back with any C++ 20 techniques that I used or standard library features. I just didn't do things at runtime that I didn't need to do at runtime. And this is running at full, like 100% normal emulated Commodore 64 speed. No, I didn't bring another Commodore with me to CVPCon. The last one did not survive the, tri the trip back and forth. <clears throat> This entire presentation system is custom written for the first half of this talk. And I'm right on time. Uh, Constexpr was utilized to move as much to compile time as I, as I reasonably could. Why do I say reasonable, though? Memory limits, yes. So I could have pre-rendered at compile time every single slide, every single slide transition and then just played it back as a slideshow if I had really wanted to. But that would have taken considerably more space than I had because each screen is, uh, these are actually bitmap screens because I've got my bitmap font scaling. I'm not using text mode here. 
which is why you can actually watch it draw in the, uh, the bullet points. But uh, so that would have been, I forget how big each screen is, 8K? I think it's 8K. Uh, and I would have very quickly run out of space. So I had to make a balance. I had to move the things to compile time that it made sense to and execute the things at runtime that it made sense to. I could have gone anywhere on the continuum from 0% to 100%. Ah, what is reasonable? We just covered that. So for any of you who are doing like embedded device development or something, you have to weigh this. You have to say, how much does it make sense to fit, like if you're trying to fit things on tiny Garmin watches, for example, yes, we can all hold up our Garmin watches, um, then uh, you, you're limited, right? You're not going to pre-compute everything possible. So further ideas. It is possible to have done compile time compression of all of my slide data. Then I would have just had to decompress it to print it back out. Interestingly, Ashley Roll is going to be presenting on that topic today at CVPCon. His talk is going to be remote. Uh, it is coming up this afternoon. So did I make a point, do you believe that it's possible that somewhere between 0% and 100% of your project could actually reasonably be moved to compile time? Some nods. So we gotta get real in a second here. Um, if you didn't come in yet, like if you came in and said, well, I guess I'll listen to this constexpr thing, but there's just no place for constexpr in my code, are you going, well, okay, maybe there's a place for constexpr in my code now? A little bit of half hands, an elbow maybe? All right. This is getting easier and easier as more of the standard library is constexpurified. I think that's a word. Uh, so just as a minor update, this is why we need to keep constexpuring all of the library things. It's library things that make the difference. If I couldn't use constexpr variant or constexpr uh, array or constexpr algorithms, then I would have been much more limited in what I could do in this talk. All right, we're gonna move to more practical examples and this is where I really go off script because I don't have slides at all for the rest of the half of this. That's a QR code. If you wanna follow along at home on your device or on your cell phone or laptop or whatever, you can either use the QR code or go to the tiny URL, constexpr2021. It's gonna take you to a GitHub gist that has the entire rest of the presentation on it. I'll give you all a second to get there. Question, yes? I really could. Ooh. I'm curious as why it's not a compiler job. You know, uh, I mean the optimization phase of compiler job. You need auto code and, you know, compiler some part of the code to compile. Right. Okay. Yes, so the question was, why is it not the compiler's job to just constexpr things that it knows can be constexpert and we don't have to tell it? Um, uh, there's a lot of people who have a strong argument for saying, we can't do this because if the user of the standard library function relies on it being available at compile time and then something about the implementation changes so that it can no longer be available at compile time, then they just broke the user's code without any clear way of communicating this to the user. So it's considered like a contract with the user to say, I promise that this is available at compile time and it will always be available at compile time. I'm not a standard library implementer or a compiler writer. Uh, I'm not on the standards committee, so I mostly just have to accept that argument. 
but I will say in real world code that I've been working on, I've never had a situation where I had to remove const expert from a function. If I made this function available at compile time, I never said, oh no, I actually meant that I had to do some inline assembly or I, whatever. But even now in C20, you could still like say, if is constant evaluated and block around the inline assembly and go back to something that's portable. Or you could still throw an exception just as long as you don't throw it at compile time. Because if you throw it at compile time, you'll just get a compile time error. But if you had an exceptional case, I mean, sure. <laughs> There's a uh, talk to people who are involved in compilers. Who's here? Is there any comp anyone from GCC or Clang at CVPCon in this room today? In the Visual Studio team? Well, yeah, Gabby, I've seen Gabby. I haven't seen like anyone else. Huh. Okay, so okay. If those of you who wanted to get this, did, had this what, what question. What about if, um, as a programmer, I do something inadvertently and use it in a context where uh, the compiler can't uh, const expert? Like, maybe I take an address, maybe that's an example. Is there some way I can know that? Oh, you can totally take references and pointers to const expert things at const expert time and store them in const expert ways. That's fine. Um, or but calling a const expert function, say. And you're saying, uh, could you repeat the question from the top, please? Uh, um, just um, say, if this is kind of going back to the other question about how I know that my const expert expression or function is actually being evaluated at compile time. Oh, okay. And not inadvertently because something I did um, at runtime. Uh, the compiler will stop you. If you do static const expert value equals some function, you will get a compile time error if it couldn't evaluate that at compile time. If you just call a const expert function, with parameters, I mean, const expert functions don't have to be com executed at compile time. Const expert functions are functions that may be evaluated at compile time. So if I, um, if I call a const expert function but don't do anything with the result from it, it doesn't return a result, then I have absolutely no guarantee at all that this thing's gonna be evaluated at compile time. I have to do, I do have to tell the compiler, yes, this result needs to go into a const expert variable, therefore you need to do some compile time evaluation, unless it's a const eval function, which must be executed at compile time, and that was added in C++ 20, but I have to say I don't have enough real world experience with that to talk exactly about it. I am using it in places. If anyone else has a comment on const eval, do you want to comment? You can use the mic if you want to, because you're right there, Ben. It seems to me it's ideal for UDLs. Uh, well, yes. In a case where UDLs would require anything other than const eval. Right, yeah, so that's a good point. If you want to uh, prove that your user-defined literal is evaluated at compile time, which there's almost never a reason for it to be done at runtime, const eval is a good use case there. Okay. We had the QR code. So those of you who have already been reading ahead, you already have some idea what's going on here. But this is our code. I've got character, Tepetsky, uh, templated things. None of this is really const expert yet. But the idea is that I'm taking a block of text and I am splitting it into lines that will fit on my screen 40 characters wide. And then I am centering those lines on the screen. And I have my centered line drawer, drawer. So, uh, ooh, there's no line numbers on here. That's a, that's a little bit unfortunate. Right here, I'm saying, hello world, let's write a, write a long string that needs to be split up, and after it's split, we can draw it. So I've got my centered line drawer, and I pass this string to it. So this Petsky conversion, note I have const auto string here. I'm not doing const expert auto string. So it's not doing this at compile time. The optimizer could have chosen to, but it's not in this case. 
So I can go ahead and, of course, click on everyone's favorite website, Compile Explorer. And uh, we are just kind of gonna do a little bit, like we're not gonna do the like walk through every line of assembly thing that we did last time I put this much assembly on the screen. We're just gonna scroll and say, hey look, there's no data tables in here. This whole thing is happening at runtime. The only data that we've got is this hello world string right here. That's the only compile time constant. So I've made one tiny change, and that is to take my Petsky2 function, mark it as constexpr, and then do constexpr static auto string. Again, this constexpr static because I want to say yes, you need to do this at compile time. If I just did constexpr auto, it's possible some compiler implementations might delay that to runtime because I'm not requiring that value at compile time anywhere else. So we can click over on here. And now we can see that that string is no longer at the top of the binary. And what I have is this data table, which is all of the Petsky values for that string. Done at compile time. So I'm gonna do a quick, I think, dependency inversion. I think that's the right word to use here. Uh, before, I was calling the centered line drawer and I expected it to do the work. Now, I am returning a lambda from the centered line drawer. So that's a lambda that captures all the parameters by value, which may or may not be a best practice. Uh, but I am returning that lambda. So now I'm still got my const expert static auto string, but now I get this drawing function back. And then I execute the drawing function. So I have not moved anything else to compile time at this point. I'm just setting me up so now I really can more easily. And so I will say I am now inside the continuum. Uh, how is that font size for those of you in the room? Can you read this? Okay. I have five units of work. Convert ASCII to Petsky, split one line into several, or one string into several lines, center those lines, center the paragraph, draw the paragraph. I have gone from 0% of the work being done at compile time to 20% of the work done at compile time. I have moved one work unit. Now I am going to use a lambda for save and continue behavior, which I personally think is incredibly awesome. So I've moved my drawer to also be context for static. And let's just look at this real quick. I've got const auto split equals split line, const auto centered equals center lines, const y start equals vertical center offset. Any line that I move from here to above here magically gets performed at compile time now. Does that make sense at all? I have to execute that line in order to be able to create the lambda that I'm trying to return. So now here, when I say give me back this lambda, anything that happened before the creation of the lambda had to happen at compile time. So we're going to move the split function to compile time. All I did was move it from Outs inside the lambda to outside the lambda. Now I'm capturing those results and I'm creating a const expert static lambda with the split work done at compile time. So now we can see that we've got just a tiny bit of code that's actually executing at runtime and the rest is this data table split up and we can See, this top part is actually the offsets into that string to say what string lines now actually need to get printed. 
And if we just kind of wanted to take a high level look at this, that's 35 lines of assembly being executed here. And before I did that move, it's 160. So now I've moved 40% of the program to compile time. Now I want to take the centered function and move it to compile time. What do I do? I simply move it from inside the lambda to outside the lambda. I'm still capturing it by uh, value. Oh, Compiler Explorer, don't fail me now. Okay. Uh, so now I've, what, cut the amount of code that's actually executed at runtime and half again down to 20 constructions, and my data table is getting bigger. So I've moved 60% of the program from runtime to compile time. I'm not really doing anything fancy here. I'm just moving another line of code from inside the lambda to outside the lambda. And again, requiring the compiler to do that work for me at compile time here when I create that lambda at compile time. And uh, that looks basically the same, doesn't it? That's not right. Is that right? Well, the compiler had chosen to optimize that for me already. But we're proving that 80% uh, of it is moved to compile time. Now the question is, can we move 100% of this program to compile time? The last thing that I'm doing is actually taking that data, and I said I've got n number of lines that need to be here and here, and I'm writing them to the correct memory locations to output it on the screen. Can I move that to compile time? I can't move the actual writing to the physical screen at, run, at compile time, but I can create a compile time buffer. Timor says I can. So <clears throat> I have now created this little run worker function, which has a 40 by 25 buffer. That's the size of the Commodore 64 screen. And so now I get the worker. This has all of the setup done at compile time, and then I pass that to the thing that can build the buffer at compile time. And then I call blit at runtime. This is the actual function that's going to write the thing to the physical screen. Yes, Tim. Um, why are the functions like centered line drawer, um, why are they static? Why are they static? Oh, just uh, the only reason I made the free function static was so that they didn't become noise in our compiler explorer output. Because as a static function, it's not gonna be emitted into the uh, translation unit. So we just, we just don't see the noise if they're not being called because they were all being inlined and not actually doing any work at all at runtime. So it was just to clean up our output there. The person who asked that, you're free to use these Godbolt links and delete static and just see that it creates the function at the top of the output. Okay, so now I've moved 100% of my program to compile time except for that last draw. And this now becomes our program. We've got seven lines of assembly, move rep, move sq. All it's doing is saying, write these 1024 bytes to this location of memory. Done. So, arguably, just a mem copy. It is a mem copy, it's an inlined mem copy. 100% um, of it done at compile time. So I wanted, and I'm finishing slightly earlier than I expected to here, but that's fine. I wanted to give you a new way of thinking about ConstExpr. Reconsider what can be moved from runtime to compile time. Uh, ConstExpr data, ConstExpr static data, though, isn't really the end of this. If you consider my ARM emulator, it is entirely possible that you could take my ARM emulator, say, I want to execute these 20 instructions at compile time, and then you create an instance of that object, of the emulator state at compile time, then at runtime you can copy it and continue whatever processing you wanted to do. Oh, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, so is all of the com compile time um, benefits sort of preconditioned on that do work function where you are able to predefine that hello world string? So what happens if you didn't know that like that string was going to be that string? Would you lose all those benefits? Yeah, that's true. So if the if you didn't know, I'm just in the habit of repeating the questions because I'm used to people yelling out, not using the microphone. Um, <laughs> If, 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 if you didn't know any input at all, then no, you would not be able to do all this work. Like you had to know that input at compile time. But would there still be benefits to sort of like pre-conceiving that upfront and like still writing those functions as? Yeah, I, would, I would argue that there would still be benefit to writing this code as I did uh, for two reasons. Let's scroll back up to here. Okay, so taking, uh, that is incorrect. Oops, isn't it? Yeah, that one's wrong. No one called me out on that one. Um, <laughs> taking this version right here, where I've been passed a string view, and then I want to generate the code that can write it out to something. Let's say hypothetically that I want to draw this string more than once. Now I mentioned at the beginning of this, I called this like save and continue behavior of lambdas. I'm sure this is a technique other people used. I had not seen it used before I was messing around in this code, but I have now I can call this lambda as many times as I want to, and all of the expensive work was already done. So even if you take nothing else away from this and think, well, no, I, I don't know the input at compile time, but I do have some things that I repeat every now and then, or some state of computation that I can do up to step three, and then steps four and five have to happen at runtime, you could totally use this technique. I've seen you know, code where you like uh, create a struct with the current cache state, and it's all complicated, and you try to keep everything organized. Just let a lambda do that work for you. What is the size and shape of this lambda that I'm returning? Meh, right? I don't care. What I know is that it has my pre-computed split centered and Y start data that I need to do the rest of my work. That's pretty cool. I think that's cool. It made, I was, I was when I did this, I was like, that's cool. I'm gonna use that again someday. So hopefully you at least take that away. Hey, Jason. Uh-oh. Um, what are the iteration limitations in const expressions? How, how about limitations on recursions? Well, you know, it's, you're only limited by how much time you're willing to spend waiting for the compiler to do those. I mean, compilers all have a defaulted limitation for recursion and, and iterations. And so you might get a... Uh, you might get a compile time error saying that you exhausted those limits, but you can always just do like dash dash f const expert limits equal 20 billion and you're good. Uh, go ahead. Is this on? Oh, oh it is hey, now. Hey Jason, thanks for the talk. Um, so you keep saying that you can do this, like you can add const expert to make the compiler do these things at compile time. Uh -huh. But the compiler can do these things at compile time unless you use volatile. So what, uh, have you tried doing these code samples with like adding in just GNU always in line and some aggressive optimization to get the same results? For my use case, for this example, I had to know and prove that it was doing a compile time, otherwise it wouldn't have fit in the binary that I needed. And so that's really what I prefer to focus on, is how do we like know and prove this instead of saying, how can we convince the compiler to do it most of the time? Because in, in that case, if you made one little change somewhere that you weren't, you know, you, then you have to like reevaluate the binary. Did it still do what I wanted it to do? Uh, because again, there's no guarantees. And if I set F 
the you know inline limits to infinity, there's still no guarantees as to what it's going to evaluate at compile time, right? So, so you'd prefer that over, say, aggressive micro benchmarking or something like that to guarantee your performance. Uh, I'm not going to say it's about guaranteeing performance. I'm just saying it's about guaranteeing that something that you wanted computed at compile time was computed at compile time. OK. <laughs> that works. I might interrupt the line here so that I can get to like the last thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, go ahead, two more, though. Yeah, hi. So I have a question. So in theory, if you execute stuff at compile time, it's not actually running on your machine, right? It's running inside the compiler, which acts as this weird C++ interpreter at right. that point. So this actually has a very interesting property. You can't really have undefined behavior in there. Right? Correct. Because as soon as you do something that you're not allowed to do, because it's all interpreted, the compiler's going to know, and it, it, it's supposed to like give you a compile error. Right. So my question is, if you do this in practice, do you actually find that you do find errors uh, or bugs or like undefined behavior that you wouldn't have found if you wouldn't have done this at compile time, like in practice? I say yes, but don't believe me, because I believe the session like right after mine or this afternoon here, a local session at CVVCon, is context for the rest of the things, something like that. Does anyone remember what the title is? Anyhow, they are moving a microkernel OS to Constexper to prove that their operating system doesn't have undefined behavior because of all of their tests are executed at compile time. That's the synopsis for their talk. I don't know any other details. It's Constexper day at CVPCon. That's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> oh, real quick in, in that same vein, uh, question. There are pointer arithmetic restrictions in Constexper that prevent overruns, et cetera. Yes. Could you please talk a bit about that? I don't know if there's anything else to say about that. If you try to index past the end of allocated memory or a stack variable in context for time, you're going to hit a UB limit, and you're, it's going to fail to compile. That, that's a good thing, and that has caught bugs, like in my ARM emulator, where I'm like, what do you mean I went past the end of memory? I don't know where. Uh, so yeah, it's an entirely other topic of how to actually test context per code, but you have to compile. If you, if you are trying to actually move this much stuff to compile time, you probably have to explicitly compile two versions of your test, one that executes at compile time and one that executes at runtime because there's no compile time debugger for your compiler, unfortunately. So I just want to demonstrate this, and then I'm happy to answer any more questions. I still have got seven minutes on my clock. But um, I rolled, I scrolled down too far. I mentioned forking the continuum. So I just want, or however you want to phrase it, I just want to discuss that for a second. On this line that says static context for auto data equals run worker, that's where I've actually created the fully blitted out 40 by 25 screen of data. I can still work with that data. That's where I want to point out that constexpert can just be a tool to get you to a certain point. Like, I can do, you know, 90% of the work at compile time, but that last 5%, 10%, I have to do at runtime because that's based on some runtime input. So for example, if I had rotate left, like I want to take all the columns on the screen and just rotate it one character left so everything rotates around, you know, it's a kind of demo coding kind of thing or whatever, like have the screen rotate. That thing, I can't do, well, I could do that at compile time, but let's say I don't know how many units I want to rotate it left at compile time. Then I can write my, well, I probably shouldn't play with the mic, huh? I can write my rotate left function that takes a const reference to the screen data, does a copy of the compile time computed data, and then rotates it and returns that rotated result. <clears throat> and our, if we care to actually look at the compiled code, uh, that 
it inserted in the rotate. I mean, it got all inlined in and everything with mem moves, and then it still has that mem copy to blit it back out to the screen. So I want you to think about it as like a tool, a stepping block, stepping stone to get you there. <clears throat> I'm trying to not disappoint the camera crew by making sure that I walk around the stage as much as possible. The other thing that I want to point out is people complain about like compile times, because if you've got a whole bunch of const expert stuff all happening in header files all over the place, then you're having to do that work over and over again. It is certainly possible to move all of this git screen stuff that we were talking about to a C++ file, so it gets computed exactly once, and then at Runtime, you just access the public header function here, get screen, and it returns to you the compile time computed table of data. All the benefits, most of the benefits, not all the benefits, most of the benefits without having to uh, say, oh, but constexpert is blowing up my compile times because you just shuffle that away into a CPB file. Is um, any tips for a closed source library authors to provide constex for support to users? I think this would be exactly what they should be taking a screenshot of this right here and say, you know, they, you can get, this is as far as you can get if it's closed source and you don't want to give away. Although I don't know, like, I, I feel like perhaps just my own perspective, like what is a closed source library at this point? Because don't you have like templates in your code? Like how much of your implementation leaks out anyhow? But that's a skewed perspective I know I have in that regard. But if you want to give as much benefit as you can and, it's, and you have to firewall everything off, then this is probably gonna be your best bet. Okay, I think that's all I cared about. That screen just blinked out so that you guys know. Um, we can get back to the questions for the last couple of minutes that we have. I think they're going to turn it on in a second here. Testing. Okay. Um, so this is, this is all great stuff. And uh, I come from a perspective of maintaining a really large uh, legacy code base. And C++ 20 gave us one of the most interesting things to kind of migrate an old code base to const expert, which is, is constant evaluated. Right. But I think one of the things that we're starting to discover is that it kind of, it kind of bifurcates a lot of your code because you have to make one path that's const expert friendly and another path that's not so const expert friendly. Is that, I'm curious what specifically are you having to bifurcate around? Just out of curiosity, I know there are things. I'm not saying you're lying, I'm just you, curious You what. essentially end up with two implementations of the same algorithm. Because, I mean, because one of them's calling like standard cosine and you can't yeah, call that? Or, or like mem move or some other kind of compiler intrinsic or something like that that's not supported by the compiler. Can compiler intrinsics I can't help you with, otherwise I'll say, we need to const for the rest of the standard library, sorry. Yes, uh, I, I agree, but do you have any suggestions on approaches to that? Because you want it to be maintainable, you don't want to end up with two implementations of everything. So how do you like kind of sprinkle this in a legacy code base or do you just not even start and wait till the compiler catches up? I've personally have only used constexpr in a legacy code base where it was the obvious we can do this in this code base without jumping through a bunch of hoops. It's been uh, data tables that don't require trigonometric functions, that kind of thing. That's what I've done at this point. Otherwise, I'm just kind of waiting for the compiler. And the, yeah. Compilers are lagging behind on a couple of the C++ 20 features, as I'm sure you're aware right now. So it's, you're constantly threading this needle to try to figure out what to do. So I don't have a great answer for you. Thanks. Uh, I'll do alternate. So all of your outputs are arrays. They are. Sometimes you'll have a constex for output that is a vector, meaning a dynamic size that is the output size is based on the inputs. Yes. The problem is because we can't move constexpr for allocated memory to runtime, you first have to call the function once to get the size, and then you have to do it again to get the data, which means you've 
the compiler has to execute it twice unless it can somehow magically figure it out, oh, I already did all this work, I'm just gonna not do it. And if it can't do that, I don't know how. You don't have to execute it twice. There are techniques. I couldn't figure that out. You should go to Ashley's talk later. Okay. I do know more about what his talk is going to have in it. And it does have to deal with these things because compile time compression, you don't know what size the output's going to be, right? So, there's options. Comment, not a question. Oh, I see. Um, C++ 23 <laughs> will have more of the standard library const expert, mm -hmm. including uh, some C math functions. I, I was looking, had that been officially approved yet or not? It has not been through plenary, but ah, it's through okay. all of the process a second time. Wow, I, I take it back. It has to go back to core briefly. Cool. Anyway, long story. But <laughs> for, for some other time, uh, interestingly, unique pointer will be one of the things. Uh, unique pointer, I mean, it could have been construct in C++20, didn't require any other mechanism. And there's some other smatterings around the library, but that's from right. my talk on Friday. So on, that, on that note, it appears that the last like stable partition algorithms have not been marked constexpr yet. They should be constexperable in C++23 also. I don't know if anyone did a paper on that. No, write a paper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Have you seen in practice that the result? Oh yeah, sorry, can you? My session is over. Go ahead, go for it. I break rules. Sorry, uh, have you seen in practice that the, con the result of context was actually slower at runtime? And you can see in here, you've got some small buffers, but imagine if you have a four key screen, and instead of flipping a few pixels, you just have to copy a massive amount of data. Or another example, imagine if you had to make a runtime call for every letter you output you could end up with a large code uh, that would unroll and have basically putting each character separately and yeah, it, go characters. So it is definitely a balance. There are definitely scenarios where, like you said, I just const expert this 4K screen worth of data. If that's really what you wanted to do, it's possible that you just affected the performance of the rest of your code base because you've changed the cache pressure, basically. You just pushed out a bunch of data that would. For example, if you were doing a function call, the compiler would unroll everything and you would end up with a large amount of code that basically puts constant in, constants into registers and make it. I, uh, I'm certainly not gonna say it's not possible. In my experience, if I do have the constexpr and the compiler does choose to unroll a bunch more code, that often also then lets the compiler see more opportunities for constant folding and I end up with actually smaller code when it's done. But I know I program in a weird way. Let's see if we can get to Arthur's question and we can end this because I'm now four minutes past due. All right, and mine doesn't require a response either, but I had- Oh, more comments. of a comment, not a question? Uh, not a, yeah, exactly, <laughs> um, more of a comment. Uh, um, so I don't know if you mentioned the word DSL anywhere, but basically what you've got here, Pets your Petsky2 thing is basically a DSL for making yeah. Petsky2 data. And so you can apply this not just to like string translations, but- That's coming in CPPCon 2022 where I actually demonstrated a compile time scripting library, but I, I'm yeah. waiting for the standard library to catch up with me. Um, and then to the person who asked about um, places where that undefined behavior pointer buffer overflow checker gets you, I know one place in libc++ that that came up was in like std copy or one of these algorithms that says we have two things I'm copying from here to, to over here. I can do that really fast if they don't overlap. But if mm. they overlap, I have to do something special. Right. And the way you check for overlap is you say, well, if this void pointer is less than that void pointer or, you know, et cetera. Which you're not technically allowed to do. And const expert time, the compiler doesn't let you do that. So right. you'd have to have that if it's constant evaluated. Well, I guess we always do the slow thing. Okay. Uh, and otherwise we can do the technically undefined behavior pointer comparison. Tec it's only technically undefined behavior. All right, thank you everyone. Grab some stickers if you want to. I think I'm gonna be shuttled off to some other room for yeah. online things. We'll, we'll be moving to an online Q&A now. And if you're really dying to talk to Jason, um, you could follow him. There's just limited space for that.